بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد My dear respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, the topic I was given for today is, uh, I forget the exact official title, but it's something to do with dua. I'm sure dua is something which um, everybody resorts to. And if you go and speak to a bookstore, uh, Azhar Academy or any of these other places, uh, you'll probably find that one of the most uh, frequently selling uh, book will be a dua book. And there's no end to them, but alhamdulillah, people are so interested in du'as. It's something that people resort to all the time. Now the thing is that the people of Makkah, at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was some very important message that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa brought to them. And not just to them, but also to the philosophers and those who had uh, kind of a Hellenistic uh, philosophical uh, view of God and um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the way this world works and so on and so forth. So, essentially what you had is that the people of Makkah, they did not believe in speaking about one Allah. They had so many intermediaries that if they, if anybody, وَإِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ إِشْمَأَزَّتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was mentioned alone, then those people who don't believe in the hereafter, their hearts would feel really bad. They wouldn't like the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. They had so much love for their intermediaries, for these idols that they had uh, stood in between themselves and the one creator. So they obviously did not believe in calling on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. They would actually go and maybe make an offering to one of these idols and then ask whatever they had to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tried to give them an understanding that that's not the correct way. Then you have the philosophers. Now their thing was a bit different. Their perspective was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created this world. And unfortunately, this is a, a kind of a modern perspective as well. In the sense that there are people who think, they believe in God. They believe in God, but they think that God is passive. They think that He created everything and now He's taking a back seat. In the sense that He cannot intervene anymore in the affairs of the universe. Unfortunately, this is a belief that prevails through many religions. Not as a religious belief, but as a belief within the religion held by certain uh, individuals or groups within that religion. It's something that you will, uh, the more materialistic you become, that is how, that is where you get to because you're unable to reconcile the existence of good and evil in this world. I'm, let me leave the theological aspects because that does get a bit complicated. The main thing though is that they would never call on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly because they thought Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created everything. Everything had come from Allah, and now he was not in the picture, he could not intervene. Everything had its own ability. So a fire has its own ability to burn, etc., etc. So the Prophet ﷺ had to deal on many fronts. But initially what the Prophet ﷺ did was, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ To show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close. That when my servants ask you about me, say that I am close. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دعان. And I respond to those who call on to me whenever they call on to me. To show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there, He's available and He's close. Number two, to give them an understanding that the real bestower of good and evil is none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in the ladina istakbirun an actually wala tad'u min duni Allahi ma la yanfa'uka wa la yadurruk. Do not call on to anyone on to those Aside from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who cannot benefit you or who can neither harm you. So trying to remove that distorted understanding that harm and benefit came from these idols. Number three, that if you don't ask Allah, your creator, remember they used to believe that Allah is their creator. But then they had brought all of these people in between. So then he, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, established for them that Allah actually gets angry with you if you don't ask him. All of this relates to us as well. All of this relates to us as well. So then, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَةِ, عن عبادة سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ Those who are too arrogant to worship, my worship, 
then they will enter into the hellfire in a state of total failure and loss. Man, it, 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 numerous other ahadith, I'm going to have to wrap this up very quickly because we have very limited amount of time. The Prophet Sallallahu himself added, Man lam yaghdab alayh. Whoever does not ask Allah, Allah gets angry with him. How many of us is Allah angry with? When's the last time that we seriously did a proper dua from our hearts? Not just that we raised our hands and said a few things that we've memorized. But where our heart connected with Allah, we had that intimacy. Where we actually understood that everything can only come from Allah. And not only in the time of grief, but also in a time of thankfulness. When we've actually thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of us actually include gratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our du'as? We all turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when there's a difficulty. But how many of us dedicate a portion of our du'a just to thank Allah for the numerous bounties that He's given us? And the bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us are infinite. Because He's given us life in this world and iman by which we can earn paradise. He's given us the fact that He's happy with us by being, making us Muslims. And the bounties in paradise will be eternal and forever. That bounty on its own is uncountable. Because it will be forever. So how many of us dedicate even 10% of our du'as just to sit and thank Allah for a few of the bounties? Make this as part of our du'a. I mean, this is something that we all need to do. Now, when you look at the du'as of Rasulullah the books are filled with them. You've got many huge collections by Imam Nawi, Al-Athqar, Amul Yawmi wal Layla, Ibn Al-Qayyim's collection, Ibn Sunni's collection. There's numerous collections of du'as. The du'as of Rasulullah from a perspective of Arabic literature, for those who are connoisseurs of language and, un and understand language, from a grammatical perspective, a perspective of uh, eloquence and impact of the words that are used, of the expressions that are formulated, of the conciseness by which the Prophet is asking what he's asking, right straight to the point, great conviction, right? Just a powerful dua, they stand on their own. The duas of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa if you were to study them independently, you will find that they stand in a position of their own. Because what you have in the duas of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that you will have not have in anybody else's dua, is the fact that you have got the conviction of a messenger speaking. You've got the light of prophethood within it. And you've got the servitude of the highest servant ever to live in this world. So you've got the greatest abd, the one who had recognized his position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanallah the asra bi abdi. That's the individual who's speaking. He's got that conviction, he's got that confidence of a, a prophet and the light of a messenger. When those things come together, then eloquence of language. The Prophet ﷺ said, I was divinely granted the power of speech to say things in very short, to say things in very few words, but that could mean so many meanings. Called the Jawami'ul Kalim, Utitu Jawami'ul Kalim, as the Prophet ﷺ said, comp ability to formulate comprehensive statements. So when you look at these du'as, a few words, but they include everything. And we're going to look at a few of these du'as. And believe me, by the end of this, if you do not want to start making these du'as, then there's something, there's a problem with us. Because they're so comprehensive that if just one day, we're making these du'as every day, if just one day one of these du'as are to be accepted, our life of this world and the hereafter is sorted. It's done. Because you will understand from the comprehensive nature of the du'a. This may be something that you haven't heard before. I'm not giving you targhib towards du'a by giving you the ahadith that speak about it. You've probably heard of them many times. We're going to go into the du'as and we're going to look at what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is saying. Now, if you look at the du'as of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you'll see their eloquence. One other thing I'd like to clarify, there's probably a question on many people's minds, that in Urdu, Gujarati, and I'm not sure in, uh, in Bengali, but you, you can let me know. When we speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we make du'a to Him, we actually use, instead of saying tum or aap, we actually say tu. Right? I don't, I, I, you know, instead of using like the kind of royal plural, the respective plural, we speak very casually. Very informally, you say, tu mujayyadede. 
And the reason for that, even though you're speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has this been in anybody's mind? Has this question occurred to anybody? Yeah. The reason for this is quite clear. This is such an intimate and a personal moment that all barriers are broken. It's to make us understand that we're speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we've got access to Allah. Allah has made us close and He's brought Himself close that ask me what you want, ask me informally. Break down these barriers, speak without any pretense and speak as you would speak when you need something, recognizing your, your servitude and your need. Because when you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's the highest form of worship. The Prophet ﷺ himself said, Dua al ibadah or dua al ibadah. Dua is ibadah, dua is the kernel of ibadah. When you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your need, how is that worship? You recognize worship as something that you do when you're showing respect to someone, when you're doing something for someone to worship them. Why is it that when you're asking them for your personal need, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're asking Allah for your personal need, how does that become worship? The reason it becomes worship is because, in fact, the Prophet ﷺ said it's one of the highest forms. It's the essence of worship. The essence, the kernel of something. The reason is, when you make salat, your mind could be somewhere else. When you're doing anything else, your mind could be somewhere else. You could have a different intention. But if you're making a serious dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is a dua? Then the only reason you are making that dua is because you recognize your need. And the only one that can accomplish that need for you is Allah. So you are putting Him in a higher position that you are doing in any other, than in any other situation. That's when we're talking about a serious, a good, serious dua that you're making. So one needs to recognize that that's the power of du'a. Now let's look at the Prophet ﷺ's du'a. The Prophet ﷺ has become a bit despondent with the people of Medina, uh, of Makkah Mukarramah. They're not listening to him. They have opposed him. This is during his Makki life. He decides to go to Ta'if. I don't want to go through the whole story of Ta'if because it's probably something that all of you have heard. Right? Anybody not heard the story of Ta'if? People are going to be embarrassed to say it. Okay. Um, Hayatul Sahab, uh, actually, Hikayatul Sahaba, Fadail Amal, the first story in there, right? One of your friends should point it out. If I have time afterwards, I'll explain it to you. Okay? Because I'm not here to tell stories today. He went into Ta'if and he came out. He felt in a state of failure because they had pelted him with stones. He'd gone there to give them guidance, right? I'm speaking to you now. What's your name, brother? Sorry? Sorry? Ridwan. Ridwan. MashaAllah. I got a friend now. Ridwan, you're my friend from now. Okay. So he goes in there to make da'wah to the three tribes, the three chiefs. They don't listen to him. They gave him these weird answers. He comes out forsaken. They send the street urchins after him. He is coated in blood, he goes and he takes refuge in this orchard outside the city. Now put yourself into that position and think how you would be feeling. What would your emotional state be? What would the state of your heart be? That you've gone there because you felt despondent with your own community. You thought these people would listen to you, but they didn't listen to you as well. Now you've come out, you're all caked in blood. Would you be angry? Would you be sad? What would you be? What kind of a failure would you feel? Think of the state of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam at the time. However, this is his dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you can imagine that any dua that came out there from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's heart would be so powerful, would be so perfect in what he was speaking about and in what he was discussing. This is his dua. He says, "Allahumma ilayka ashku da'fa quwwati wa qillata hilati wa hawani 'ala an-nas." أنت أرحم الراحمين أنت رب المستضعفين وأنت ربي إلى من تكلني إلى بعيد يتجهمني أم إلى عدو ملكته أمري إن لم يكن بك غضب علي فلا أبالي غير أن عافيتك هي أوسع لي أعوذ بنور وجهك الذي أشرقت له الظلمات وصلح عليه أمر الدنيا والآخرة من أن يحل علي غضبك وأن ينزل بي سخطك لك العتبى حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بك And if only you could understand this from directly the Arabic language, you would appreciate the eloquence, the impactful nature, the direct nature of this dua. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. Oh Allah, 
unto you do I, do I complain of my weakness, of my helplessness, and of my lowliness before men. O oh, most merciful of the merciful. He's blaming himself. He's blaming his own weakness. He's not that they didn't listen to me, you didn't help me. Imagine your state. When the Prophet ﷺ came out of Ta'if, something else had taken place, which is mentioned in the stories. The angel of the mountains had come. Ta'if is in a valley, and the angel had asked that out of compassion for Rasulullah, seeing what had happened to him, give me the order, and I will have these two mountains come together and crush everybody in everybody that's between them. Now, anybody else may have thought that that would be a great idea, but Rasulullah was obviously on a whole different level with this. So, this is the dua that he reads. Not to repeat the dua again, but the translation. If you ponder over the translation, you should understand what the Prophet is saying. So, firstly, he says, O oh Allah, unto you do I complain my weakness, of my helplessness. And of my lowliness before men, that they don't respect me. O most merciful of the merciful, you are the Lord of the weak. You are my Lord. Into whose hands will you entrust me? Unto some far off stranger who will ill treat me? Or unto some foe who you have given power over me? If you are not angry with me, then I care not. But for your favoring help, for it is the broader way. I seek refuge in the light of your countenance, whereby all darkness is illuminated, and the affairs of this world and the next are rightly ordered, lest you cause your anger to descend upon me. He is still fearful that he hasn't done his job sufficiently. After all of that, after being penalized for it, being persecuted for it, he is still feeling that he hasn't done enough. That he is, it's his lowliness among the men. And he's saying, as long as you're, you're happy with me, then I, I care not about anything else. So he says, lest you cause your anger to descend upon me and your wrath to beset me, it is yours to reproach me, to tell me off. It's yours to reproach me until you are well pleased. There is no power, no might except you. Only a man who understands his level with Allah and the level of Allah above all of the universe, only that person could say something like this. And it's a dua that you and I can use, especially if you're in the field of da'wah. And you have gone somewhere and it hasn't worked out for you. And you're feeling bad and you're feeling in fact angry because you went out of your way to show your kindness. You went and favored them, you helped them, you assisted them, and you did whatever you could, and they still rebuked you. This is the dua, this is our response. Because it's all in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's go forward to Arafah. Arafah is that day of the year when shaitan is not seen more despicable at any other day. Shaitan stands on the sides and he sees the people. He sees the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descend upon the people in such abundance that he is seen as so humiliated meaning shaitan becomes so humiliated so despondent so hopeless that he could mislead anybody on that day because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to just shower everybody with mercy now on that day you are responsible you've got 124,000 sahaba who have embraced you who have embraced your religion. This is the Prophet I'm speaking about. Now imagine on that day, you're among 124,000 people, the majority of which are probably clad in white clothing, all the same in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, totally in a level of submission, a level of emotion, emotion, emotional connection with the divine. What is the dua that's going to come from a messenger at that time? What, what words could come out of the mouth of a, a prophet of Allah, a messenger of Allah? 
Now I say a prophet and a messenger because you should realize that there's a difference between the two. Not all prophets were messengers. There were only 313 or 315 messengers, that those who brought a new way, a new sharia, like Ibrahim and Musa and Isa and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Otherwise Harun alayhi was not a messenger, he was just a prophet. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was both. This is the dua that he makes in Arafah. He says, Allahumma innaka tasma'u kalami wa tara makani wa ta'lamu sirri wa alaniyati la yakhfa alayka shay'un min amri wa ana al-ba'is al-faqir al-mustaghith al-mustajir al-wajid al-mushfiq al-muqir al-mu'tarif bi dhanbi as'aluka mas'alat al-miskin wa abtahilu ilayka ibtihal al-mudhnib al-mudhnib al-dhalil wa ad'uka wa ad'uka du'a al-khaif al-darir wa du'a man khada'at laka raqabatuhu wa fadad laka 'abratuhu wa dhalla laka jismuhu wa raghima laka anfuhu allahumma la taj'alni bi du'aika shaqi وكن لي رؤوفا رحيما يا خير المسؤولين ويا خير المعطين. Just look at the way the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam frames his words. What he says first, the, he positions himself. If you if you look at any of these du'as, he's not saying, Oh Allah, this happened, forgive me. Oh Allah, just give me this, give me this. He doesn't go into asking straight away. He builds up the story. He, he shows what exactly his position is. You have to praise Allah. You have to show who he is and what you are and why you're asking him. So look, this is, this is what he says. Oh Allah, you can hear my speech. You can hear me speaking. You see where I am and my situation and my circumstance. You know my inside and my outside. You know my inner self and my external self. None of that is hidden from you. Every, none of that is none of my matter, none of my matter is concealed from you. I am the afflicted one, the poor and needy one, the one who is seeking your succor and your help and your refuge, the one who is in pain and who is trembling, the one who is confessing of my sin. The one who is confessing of my sin, I ask you like the poor person asks you. And I entreat and pray to you humbly like the humiliated sinner prays to you. He's really showing that I need your help. I am making dua to you like the humiliated sinner, his emotional state of a humiliated sinner who just feels so bad. How would he pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I pray like that to you. I pray and then he carries on. He says, I make dua to you. The dua of the afflicted one. The one who is in need. The dua of the one who's... The dua of the one whose neck is bowed down in submission to you. The one whose tears have, have flowed for you. The one whose whole body is in humility in front of you. And the one whose nose has rubbed on the ground. You have to put yourself down. You can't act arrogantly in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the messenger, the greatest of Allah's creation is doing this. Then he says, Oh Allah, la taj'alni bi du'aika shaqiyyan. Oh Allah, do not fail me in my du'as. Like don't not respond to me. And be merciful be most merciful and compassionate to me. Oh, the best of those who are asked. The best of those who people ask and the best of those who give. Now you think that dua is not going to be accepted? Have we ever made a dua like this? And this dua is not copyright. It is not exclusive. You can take it and make it. And if you want this dua, go to zamzamacademy.com. This, all of this selection is available on there. Download it, zamzamacademy.com. It's, it's an anthology of dua. You can download these duas from there. And people have been asking, what dua book should we read? You get a dua book, take the Hizbul A'zam of Mullah Ali Al Qari. You can get it from Azhar Academy. You can get it from most other bookstores. There's an English translation available as well. The Shaykh in there has compiled 
all of the comprehensive du'as from the Quran and the Hadith. And then at the end he finishes off with the blessings on the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You just have to re read a part of it every day. You could finish it in a week or you could finish it in a month. But I make dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that He give all of us the tawfiq. To take that book or any other book that you have of comprehensive duas and to make a litany and a regimen of reading it every single day, however many we read, whether it's a page. Because can you imagine it that all these duas of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if we are to make them all over the course of a week or a month or even a year and then one day those du'as are accepted each one of this is so powerful if this du'a is accepted oh Allah don't make me fail in my du'a to you if just that one du'a is accepted it's done it's made for us there's another du'a I'll show you a few comprehensive du'as of Rasulullah just to teach us the etiquette of du'a through the du'as of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now there's another du'a. Let's imagine you've got a limited amount of time. You've got a short amount of time to make a du'a. What are you going to ask for and what are you not going to ask for? What are you going to miss out and what are you going to focus on? In a short amount of time. Let us call the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let us quote one of his du'as where everything is included in a matter of a few words. Because he is the master composer of du'as. He knows how to make a du'a. He knows what words to use. He says, Allahumma inni abduk wa abnu abdik wa abnu amatik. Oh Allah, I am your servant. And I am the son of your servant. And I am the son of your female servant. So you have to frame yourself as who are you? I'm your servant and I am also the son and I'm the son of your male and your female servant as well. So even my parents are your servants. Nasiyati biyadik, maadin fiya hukmuk, adlun fiya qadauk. And he carries on and he says, my forelock is in your hand. I am subject to your decree. Your decision is justice in itself. It can't be anything but just whatever you decide and you decree is justice in itself. And then he says, أَسْأَلُكَ بِكُلِّ إِسْمٍ هُوَ لَكَ سَمَّيْتَ بِهِ نَفْسَكَ أَوْ أَنزَلْتَهُ فِي كِتَابِكَ أَوْ عَلَّمْتَهُ أَحَدًا مِّنْ خَلْقِكَ أَوْ إِسْتَأْثَرْتَ بِهِ فِي عِلْمِ الْغَيْبِ عِنْدَكَ أَنْ تَجْعَلَ الْقُرْآنَ نُورَ صَدْرِي وَرَبِيعَ قَلْبِي وَجَلَاءَ حُزْنِي وَذِهَابَ هَمِّي the Prophet knew what to, what to use to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to get his dua accepted. He uses the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what he says. He says, I ask you by every name that is yours. I ask you by every name that is yours. I don't have to say all of them. I just ask you by every name that is yours, which you have named yourself with, or which you have revealed in your book, because there are certain names that are mentioned in the Quran only, some, not all. Which you, have revealed, which you have revealed in your book, those which you have taught to any of your creation, they may not be in the Quran, but you may have inspired somebody else with the knowledge of that name, or which you have kept to yourself. Those names you haven't revealed to anybody, and you've left the knowledge of that to yourself, in the knowledge of the unseen. I ask you with all of those names, that you make the Quran the light of my breast, the springtime of my heart, the removal of my sorrows and the departure of my worries. Now, if this dua is accepted, the Quran is ours. That love that we want for the Quran that constantly our ulama keep telling us about, that only comes in Ramadan for some of us, that will become ours. Another dua. This one really shows where he encompasses everything. As always, he starts with praise for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this should have taught us one lesson. That we're not going to jump into asking him something like a real despicable beggar. Right? We're going to ask him like a pious beggar. Right? So we're going to praise him first. We have to have some dignity. Right? Allah likes dignity. La ilaha illallah al-halim al-kareem. Subhanallahi rabbil arsh al-azim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. As'aluka mujibati rahmatik. As'aluka mujibati rahmatik. Wa azaima maghfiratik. 
والغنيمة من كل بر والسلامة من كل إثم لا تدع لي ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا حاجة هي لك رض هي لك رضا إلا قضيتها يا أرحم الراحمين. He says there is no god but Allah the forbearing the most generous. You're attracting that generosity, the forbearance. Forbearance means somebody who sees your faults and still overlooks them. So you're saying, oh Allah, you're the forbearing. You're the generous one. You give. And remember, Allah loves to be praised. And the Prophet ﷺ knows that. That's why in the hereafter, as mentioned by the previous speaker, he, didn't, he wasn't able to mention it in detail, that the Prophet ﷺ, when he goes to intercede, he will fall in sajda and praise Allah with absolutely new and unique praises which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have inspired him only on that day. Allah wants to be praised by them. Anyway, he says, the most generous, glory be to Allah, Lord of the exalted throne, to show that he's got the might over everything. That utmost and most powerful omnipotent being praise be to Allah Lord of the worlds your control is on the arsh and also of the worlds I ask you only after this does he start to ask him I ask you for that which evokes your mercy it's a general dua I want all of those things which will bring about your mercy for deeds which bring your forgiveness for the benefit for the benefit of complete piety not sometimes I'm pious and sometimes I'm not. Complete piety. From safety from all error. Do not leave me with any sin unforgiven. Any worry not removed by you. Or any need that is pleasing to you without fulfilling it. Most merciful of those who show mercy. What's left in this dua? Does it leave anything? The dunya and the akhirah is done. No grief, full piety, everything. Another dua, similar. Allahumma aslih li dini alladhi huwa ismatu amri. Wa aslih li dunya yallati fiha ma'ashi. Wa aslih li akhirati yallati fiha ma'adi. Waj'al al-hayata ziyadatan li fi kulli khayr. Waj'al al-mawta rahatan li min kulli shar. This one is talking about the affairs of both this world and the hereafter. Now look how comprehensive this dua is. Oh Allah, put right for me my religion. I never have confusions then about my religion. Is this the true opinion? Is this the opinion? I am away from all of this confusion. I am absolutely confident about my religion. Which, the, which is the preservation of my affairs? Put right for me my worldly life, in which is my existence. My religion is sorted, my dunya is sorted. And put right for me my hereafter, to which is my return. Now my akhirah is sorted. Make life an increase for me in every good, and make death for me a release from every evil. It's a dua you'll find in Sahih Muslim. Now which, what has he left here? You've sorted your deen, sorted your hereafter, made the dunya good, made the akhirah a place to go. A few very small ones. The Prophet ﷺ, just the, the, such ability to say the right things. This one is, Allahumma ja'al sarirati khayran min ala niyati, wa ja'al ala niyati salihatan. O oh Allah, make my inner self superior to my outer self. Because the inner self is a bit more difficult to deal with. The outer self, you just have to put your, you know, be confident enough and sort yourself out. Right? Make my inner self superior to my outer self. And make my outer self righteous. This is a struggle we have. The men are keeping beards and the right clothing, the women are covering themselves and everything, but it's an internal turmoil. Nobody knows about it, alhamdulillah. If our sins of our hearts were to be exposed to people, we, we couldn't show our face. May Allah protect us and forgive us. But this is the way to 
strengthen our inside over our outside. That the Prophet ﷺ understands this. He understands the human dilemma. And thus he is saying, our inside should be better than our outside. Oh Allah, make it such. <coughs> Finally, another thing. How is it that you can be respected by people, but then that respect not lead you to arrogance and pride and making you feel that you're better than someone else? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his this du'a of his he says, "Allahumma j'alni fi aini saghira, wa j'alni fi a'yun nasi kabira." Oh Allah, make me small in my sight, but make me great in the sight of others. If we are small in our sight, it doesn't matter how great people think we are, we won't become dislodged, we won't become arrogant. But it's a du'a. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is dealing with paradoxes. He is reconciling between opposites. He is dealing with things that seem confusing. How does greatness come with us feeling, uh, us feeling uh, arrogant? How do we deal with that situation? If we can just feel that we are small in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and people respect us, alhamdulillah, at least they will not humiliate us. They won't take our rights from us. They'll respect us and respect is a good thing. But self-respect is a good thing. But arrogance is a bad thing. And this is what this is seeking protection from. Another thing is that when we're young, mashallah, we can do many things. Now remember, you guys, stop putting your hands into your pockets. Because this is, there's going to be a fundraiser after this. I'm just preparing you for that. That's why I'm taking a few more minutes. Even though I've been given my card to get off this chair. When we're young, we have the ability to earn. What happens when we have the ability to earn, we can spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We could use things in a good way. What happens when we become old and we can't earn anymore? And we haven't given sadaqah in our earlier days. What's going to happen? Look at what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Look at his dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ja'al khayra umri akhirahu. Waj'al... وَاجْعَلْ خَيْرَ عَمَلِي خَوَاتِمَهُ وَاجْعَلْ خَيْرَ أَيَّامِي يَوْمَ أَلْقَاكُ Subhanallah, he's asking for the best of the best. He's saying, Oh Allah, make the best of my life the last part of my life. Why do we want it that we want the last part to be when we're disabled and we can't do anything? The Prophet ﷺ used to make dua for protection from evil old age. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-haram, min an uradda ila arzal al-umur. That I be returned to evil old age. It's saying, with dua, our dua to Allah is, Oh Allah, make the last of my life the best of my life in your sight. That doesn't mean that right now it's going to be bad. Now it's good. But that's going to be better. It's all relative. So you mustn't feel that we're trying to discount this side for that side. No, this side is good and great, but that one is just better. The last of the life is just the best. And then, and the, my, the best of my actions, my final sealing actions, those actions which I do just before I die. Just if this dua is accepted, your whole life is great. Because it's guaranteed then. Because it says that إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْخَوَاتِيمِ Actions are according to their endings, their sealing states. And finally he said, make the best of my days. You enjoyed your day here, you enjoyed your day there. You look forward to a good day. Oh Allah, make the best of my days the day I meet you. When you will look to me with your mercy and your compassion. And you will tell me to go to paradise without any questioning. Ameen. And about the, the provisions and the sustenance, Allahumma ja'al awsa'a rizqika alayya inda kibari sinni wa anqita'i umri. O oh Allah, make the broadest of your sustenance on me when I'm old. Open up the doors of your sustenance on me, the broadest, when I'm older. I don't mind getting a lot right now, but I want the most when I'm, when I'm old. And when I'm about to die. Why? Because then you can give sadaqah. That doesn't mean you don't give sadaqah right now. Because only by giving sadaqah right now that we're going to train ourselves to giving greater sadaqah then. Otherwise we're going to be miserly. Believe me, who finds it difficult to pay 10 pounds in sadaqah? 
Just put your hand up slightly so I can kind of just see. All right, no problem. I used to feel that way as well. Probably still feel that way sometimes, right? What you do is close your eyes, right? Like kind of close your eyes, pull out your wallet, take out, 10, take out 15 pounds. So if 10 pounds is your problem, take out 15 pounds and just give that. Like just, just, just get angry and just give it, right? The next time it will be easier for you. Believe me, personal experience. Now, if your problem is 50 pounds, and you, we always want to get better, don't we? If your problem is 50 pounds, actually you earn a living and so on, then take out 60 or 7, just, just take out 7, just look at, you know, mashallah, nice money, just take out 70 pounds, you know, pretend you're going to do something else with it, right? It's going towards your next iPad or whatever, right? I don't believe in that religion, by the way. Okay. So, um, you, you take out 70 pounds, and then just give it. We're going to do this, right? Whatever your challenge is, whatever your threshold is, let's do more than that. But believe me, that's the way to... Because once you've given out uh, 15 pounds instead of 10, and if you, can, if you want to get really angry, get, give 20 pounds. Believe me, next time 10 pounds will be peanuts for you. That's the way. You just have to open up your heart. It says that you're restricted. It's about restriction of the heart. At the end of the day, it's just imagine your heart is restricted. You have to push it open a bit. The only way you're going to do it is give it a jerk. And that's by putting out 20 pounds if 10 pounds is a problem for you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it back to you. I know a young kid, he gets 2 pounds a week. He gets 2 pounds a week spending money. His father gave it to him. Took him to the masjid for dhuhr, and there was some collection from Pakistan taking place outside, he puts a pound in there. That's 50% of his salary he just put in there. Subhanallah, pray for that brother. That's 50% of his salary. May Allah give us all the tawfiq. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Again, just to reiterate, you can get a collection of this, uh, because many people normally ask about that, or can you write that dua for me? It's there on zamzamacademy.com. You can just download it and print them out, inshallah. Make dua for me, make dua for the organizers, and all our people who are suffering around the world as well. They really need our duas minimum, and inshallah, our help and our assistance. And uh, number two, get a copy of any dua book. But the, one of the best you could get is Al-Hizb Al-Azam, and start reading a bit every day. Okay, Jazakallah khairan.